let's say you're selling something for a hundred bucks, but 50% of it is profit versus something you're selling for a hundred bucks, but only 20% of it is profit. You're thinking about your bundle. If you include that Black Friday bundle to highlight your more profitable item, your Black Friday is going to overall be more profitable. Hello, and welcome to another episode of What's Working in E-Commerce. I'm your trusty host, Egan Heath from Asymmetric Marketing. We're a digital marketing agency, and we do all kinds of things like on-site SEO, paid search, paid social, email marketing automation, and WooCommerce sites. So check us out at asymmetric.pro. Today, I'm speaking with Emily Sherio. She is founder and CEO at Turbine. And we're going to be talking all things COGS and more. So, Emily, welcome. Thanks again for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Right on. We were chatting a bit beforehand, and you were at some big name brands before you started this company. Maybe give us the history and how you got into what you do at Turbine. Yeah. My name is Emily Sherio, CEO and founder of Turbine. And the Turbine journey actually starts almost a decade before buying a domain name is the joke I like to make. I worked at Smile Direct Club, one of the early direct-to-consumer telehealth companies, real pioneer there, back in 2016. And for folks who are in D2C today, it can be hard to remember the world before Shopify, but uh, Smile Direct Club was a direct-to-consumer, one of these brands really pushing direct-to-consumer before Shopify when you were building your own dev and tech stack in-house and all of those sorts of things. And I was the first data engineer there back then and found that I worked really hard to grow a network of folks who were in similar roles at other direct-to-consumer companies, Casper and Harry's and Minted and Billy and these early, early pioneers. What I found from having these relationships is that a lot of us were having the same problems. We were all trying to understand the same metrics. We were building similar infrastructure, but we were all doing it in slightly different ways. The one problem that really stood out at Small Direct Club, separate from a lot of these other brands, was around COGS and supply chain. And the reason for that, for those who are unfamiliar with what Small Direct Club was, it's direct-to-consumer braces, basically. You straighten your teeth, and what would happen is you'd take a mold of your teeth at home, send it in, they'd come up with a treatment plan, and you'd get aligners, a new set every however many weeks. And you could get four treatments or four aligners over the course of your treatment, or you could get 20 aligners over the course of your treatment. It depended on the state of your teeth. And this Um, would be like Invisalign, but you're going direct with the company, no dentist or orthodontist needed. Is that right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And we're not talking about whether or not that's a good idea. Consult with your medical provider and all those disclaimers, but yeah, that's exactly what it is. Direct to consumer Invisalign. And Align, Invisalign's parent company, was an investor in Small Direct Club for a long time. If, if you're interested in going down that rabbit hole, there's some fun litigation between the two of them you can read. But the Small Direct Club, because we sold one thing, customers bought straight teeth, but their the cost to serve them was different. And so we had to calculate COGS on the individual level which was very different from my peers at these other companies where they were making a razor or a mattress or a stationary. You were producing those in such big batches, you were calculating COGS manually and that was fine because you were not worried about the individual units, averages were sufficient, and that wasn't the case at SDC. So I left Smile Direct Club, I went and I started some or I worked in software, really learned how to build a software business, worked at great companies like GitLab and Netlify. And then in 2022, saw the opportunity. I just finished grad school. I had done some work in supply chain and found this was still a really big pain point for brands. There was an opportunity. I believe there was an opportunity to build something here. Spent a couple months talking to everyone who would hop on a call with me and then started Turbine. In December 2022, we raised a small pre-seed round and we've been live with customers ever since. Very cool. And I talk with lots of people in e-commerce, obviously on that side, but then on my team too, there's sort of these acronyms that come up. And at some point we reach these ones where as a marketing agency, it's a little outside of what we're doing. 
And ERP is one of those. I had a team member ask just this mm. week of what, what is ERP? What's that about? So maybe for those of us on the marketing side, I wonder if you could enlighten my account managers and, and me and other people that are watching and listening too. Yeah, that's a great call out. We should also talk about what COG stands for because people think it's C-O-G and then the S just makes it plural, but it's actually not. So let's start with ERP and then we can talk about COGS. So ERP is Enterprise Resource Planning. And it is a very confusing way of just saying what most companies mean by their accounting software. So when most companies say we have an ERP, they mean they've upgraded from, or not even upgraded, graduated is a better word, from QuickBooks or Xero or Final Loop into a big legacy system. And the reason I call out that it's accounting related is that almost always accounting complexity is the driver of that jump. You have too many subsidiaries and QuickBooks isn't working for you anymore, or you're dealing in too many currencies and QuickBooks isn't working for you anymore. So that's why you look to enterprise level accounting software. And there's a couple of different players out there, mostly legacy systems that people don't like to use. Uh, the other side of the coin, COGS, which is what I like to talk about, is cost of goods sold, C-O-G-S. And a good way to know if the person you're talking to knows what they're talking about is whether when they write it down, they capitalize all four letters or they capitalize C-O-G and then lowercase d-s as if it's plural. Fun little tidbit there. It's not ATMs. It's, it's cost of goods sold. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. good. I got it. And Emily, maybe you could talk us through what should be included in cost of goods sold and what should not. So this is a tricky question. And the unsatisfying answer is it depends. You should definitely sit down with your accountant and understand the nuances of your business. But we'll talk in high level strokes here so that brands can understand and use that as a starting point. So I like to use the example of a jar of peanut butter. If you're buying and manufacturing a jar of peanut butter, you you might have a turnkey manufacturing process where you pay your co-man who's going to produce all those items and your co-man is going to buy your jars, they're going to buy your lid, they're going to buy the ingredients for you. Then your cost of goods sold in that turnkey manufacturing world is the cost that you're paying your co-man for those jars of peanut butter plus the cost to move that item to where it can be fulfilled. So if you've got a Shopify store, you use a 3PL, it's the cost of producing that jar of peanut butter plus moving it to your 3PL, whether that's by land, sea, air, whatever that freight cost looks like, even if it's by UPS, like by mail. Um, <clears throat> pack and pick fees don't go into cost of goods sold. They go into your profitability, but they're not your COGS. On the other hand, let's say you're doing the annual, the actual manufacturing for that jar of peanut butter. You're buying the jars, you're buying the lids, you're buying the labels, you're buying the ingredients, you're sending them all to your co-man who is just making it for you and assembling it. So the cost of goods sold would be the cost of all those raw materials, the cost of sending those raw materials to your co-man, the cost of uh, whatever you're paying your co-man for assembly. Oftentimes what we'll see is like there's a, a production fee, flat fee, and then a per unit cost. And then the cost of moving those items from your co-man to your 3PL for fulfillment. Again, it's all the things that go into making that item that get it to a place where it can be fulfilled. And things Great. that become tricky or key considerations people might want to think about what drives changes in your COGS is oftentimes around freight especially as we think about the last couple of years where we've seen uh, COVID put a strain on the supply chain. We've seen the situation in the Red Sea and the Suez Canal, the, the situation at the Panama Canal and the drought, like all of those things change shipping costs. And so that can be a key driver in why brands are seeing variance in their COGS. And so one of the worst things you can do is say, Oh, I agreed with my suppliers that we're going to do this price. And then one time the freight was this. You have to keep a continuous eye on your COGS because those numbers are changing every time you're ordering something new. And then if you decide to rush ship something, rush produce something, or you have 
goods coming in from overseas, you air freight it instead of send it by container ship. That's also going to drive those COGS numbers. Yeah. And we may have covered this too, but maybe you could just remind everybody too, like, why is it so important to be on top of this? Why is this important for brand owners? Obviously costs are a big part of it. This is a big part of the complexity of e-commerce, but I wonder if you could talk about why COGS specifically are so important. I think you've done a good job highlighting why it's com complicated right now, right? Yeah. So there's a couple of different parts to it. And I think understanding or how understanding COGS drives changes to the business actually starts with where you are in the business. The first piece as you're starting and growing and getting off the ground is how do we uh, just understand our unit economics, right? Are we profitable? Are we doing the thing that's going to lead to a sustainable business model here? And if the unit economics are there, then you're in great shape. The next piece after that is really like, how do we improve those unit economics? And understanding your COGS and the different numbers that go into it can help you understand which levers you can pull to do that. Is the variability in shipping? Could you increase the units being produced at any given time so you have fewer shipments? You're going to have to play and find that balance between cash flow and unit economics there, right? So there's a couple of different pieces to consider. And then long term, as you think about how to use this information more strategically in the business, I like to use the example of a Black Friday bundle. Black Friday is coming around. Everyone wants to increase that average order volume. You're going to know more about this than I do. But one of the key factors that I think brands should consider is what the profitability of a given SKU is in the decision to bundle or not bundle. And so let's say you're selling something for a hundred bucks, but 50% of it is profit versus something you're selling for a hundred bucks, but only 20% of it is profit. You're thinking about your bundle. If you include that Black Friday bundle to highlight your more profitable item, your Black Friday is going to overall be more profitable. And so you can use the understanding of your unit economics for particular units to help drive better bundling and pricing decisions throughout the organization. Yeah, that's great. I would add too, I think part of the idea in our world is if we're running paid traffic, we need to understand what's acceptable, what's cost mm -hmm. per acquisition. And so that's going to be influenced by what are the margins, what are the variable costs on these products, right? Absolutely. Is there, I, when I'm thinking COGS, I'm thinking variable costs, but is that is that not quite right? Are they not totally the same thing as one a square, one's a rectangle? They're just different things. So lots of things can go into your variable costs of the business that are not part of your COGS. The rule of thumb that I would say is if it doesn't go into the actual widget getting to the place where it can be fulfilled to the customer, it's not part of COGS. An example you might consider is if you have a marketing insert that you send in every package to a consumer, maybe it's got a barcode they can scan or a QR code they can scan to like leave you a review. That might be, it goes in every order, you're paying for it, but it's actually a marketing cost. It's not cost of goods sold. And so there's a lot, it Accounting is one of those things that just you have to learn to grow a business, unfortunately, because there are all these nuances to it. And you want to be focused on building a brand, building an incredible product, but getting just the like basics of accounting and understanding these numbers, what it ends up doing in our experience is it clears up the space for you to focus on the product, the brand, those things that really differentiate your business. Yeah, that's well put. I know it's said it's the business of language, so it makes sense. You need to know it. I think I have it right then. Cogs are a variable cost, but there are variable costs even outside of cogs potentially. Exactly. Okay. And maybe you could describe us, tell a story or just give us an example of how do we know when someone's got a problem with this where they don't know their numbers correctly, they don't have the right information, they're not able to get the right information? Maybe just tell a story or paint a picture when someone's got a problem with their COGS. There are a whole industry of COGS consultants out there. And what they do is they sit in your books, they charge you a gajillion dollars, which is a very technical term. They open up all your books, they look at historical numbers, they try to piece those together to sales, and they give you a rough unit economics. 
And so oftentimes what we see when brands are starting to think about scale or, excuse me, they're getting some traction and they're really investing in these systems. What they find is they spend money on these COGS consultants, they get this like one-time number, and then they think we're going to use these numbers for the rest of forever. And I've seen so many situations come out of that. We do lots of calls with brands understanding what their current situation looks like. And inevitably, we have these spreadsheets, these monster spreadsheets. They take two minutes to load up in the browser. And they have do not use labeled on tabs or they have inaccurate or hidden columns that like do not delete under any circumstances because it would break everything um, because they're like house of cards, really. And the numbers that those consultants calculated one year ago, we've had 12 major events since then. Uh, those numbers might not be accurate anymore. Uh, and so we talk to brands and I'll ask a head of ops or head of finance, how long are you spending calculating COGS every month? And they'll say, I was on a call two days ago. She said, I spend at least six hours a month just on the like last mile of reviewing the COGS numbers everyone else has put together. And I think that's a bummer because imagine six hours a month. There are so many more strategic and valuable things you can do for the business. And this isn't like, how do we improve our COGS discovery? It's how do we, what are the numbers? What are the baseline numbers that we need every month for bookkeeping purposes? And so if we can help you get that continuous understanding of those numbers, you can spend those five, six, 10 hours a month doing something much more strategic. Yeah, it seems like there's a real need there. I've, I've heard anytime you have a lot of complicated spreadsheets hanging out like that and you're spending hours and hours in them, that's really ripe for a software, custom software or SaaS tool. So it sounds like you're really playing mm -hmm. in the right space there. Pretty interesting. Hmm. And then once someone has those numbers, what's some action they can take? It sounds like there's things you can do to change your COGS or to change some of those costs. It, 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 did I understand that right of you might order in different quantities to get different scale? Is that kind of the right idea? You might order in different quantities. You might change the way you ship. You might look at new suppliers. A parallel to think of is almost like the first time someone starts using budgeting software. If you use like a Mint or a YNAB or a Monarch or one of those players, is that when you realize how much you're spending on groceries, like the first step is just knowing what the actual numbers are. And then you can pass on the fancy expensive version of whatever and, and buy the other version, the cheaper version. Well, Emily, I wonder if there's anything you want to leave people with in terms of how should they be thinking about their COGS and just this whole process of getting those numbers nailed down. I would say the biggest thing is ensure that you're focused on something, a uh, solution that's continuous. So if you're going to do this manually in a spreadsheet, do it. But know what numbers need to go into it, know what numbers need to drive it, and know that you're going to have time to do it every month. Don't fall into the trap of doing it twice a year or once a year or once a quarter. Um, make sure every shipment, every batch, exactly what the landed cost is. Um, I'm happy to talk to folks over at Turbine if that's if they're looking for automated solutions for this. But more than anything, just know that it needs to be a continuous process. It's not a, a thing you can do a couple of times a year and wave off your hands. Yeah, this is probably a good time to talk about Turbine. I'll pull up the site here. I just want to say the design looks great. It's beautiful. I really enjoy the site. I'm at helloturbine.com. Um, who's a good person to reach out to you guys and what's the next step here? So we generally talk to folks in ops or supply chain or finance parts of the org, but it depends on the stage of your business and anyone who takes your understanding your supply chain costs seriously, we're happy to chat with you. That's great. I know you've got a sub stack and some other things going on. Where can people follow you and check out what you're doing? The only place you can find me really is on LinkedIn. If you'd like, my name's Emily Sherio, or I write this occasional sub stack on the intersection of parenting and work and life. One of my thesis about things is that if we take the work skills that or the skills we use at work, project planning, foresight, a little bit of coordination, and we applied those to our home lives, we would have more efficient home lives and we can spend less time 
doing the admin that goes into two working parents with little kids or and rather spend that time enjoying our families. And so I write about that and about the th just general thoughts on work in general. Very cool. Love it. A great note to yeah. end on. Emily, thank you so much for coming on and sharing what's working in e-commerce. Thank you, Egan. This is great. I'm so glad. And anyone who's interested can reach out Emily at helloturbine.com. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Emily.